Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on Get the Most Out of Go Anywhere, Achieving Cloud File Transfers and Integrations. We know many of you are current customers and some of you are new to Go Anywhere, so either way, well, welcome and we're glad you're here. Uh, a few things to know before we get started. The event is scheduled for an hour. We are recording the event, so if you'd like to rewatch it or share it with a colleague afterwards, you definitely can. And we'll send out a link to the recording within a day after the event. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A pane, and we'll have a couple team members online answering them throughout the presentation. And we'll also, uh, if, if time permits, have a Q&A time at the end of the webinar if you'd like to stay on the line and submit a question live. And lastly, after we wrap up today, you'll see a quick survey pop up. Filling that survey out gives us good feedback on what parts of the presentation were most helpful to you. If you have any questions that aren't answered on today's call, you can enter those there as well and someone will get back to you. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers for today. So we'll actually have two presenters today. I'll go ahead and introduce you to both of them. Dan Freeman has spent the last 10 years of his career in various security roles, ranging from system engineer to security officer. And he currently serves as senior solutions consultant at Help Systems for the Go Anywhere product line. And then Steve Libby has been in IT for 18 years, and he currently heads up research and development at Help Systems for the Go Anywhere product line. Welcome, Dan and Steve. Thank you. All right. So I will go through our agenda quick, and then I'll hand it off to these guys. So what we're going to cover today is uh, starting with the cloud, kind of overview of benefits, the growth of the cloud, and common objections to the cloud that people often have. Um, we're going to talk through capabilities that Go Anywhere offers in terms of the cloud. And then we're going to talk through our cloud connectors, what they are, how to use them, and some cool examples of how customers are actually already using them in their environments. And as I mentioned, we will have some time for questions at the end. With that, Dan and Steve, you guys can take it away. All right, thanks, Brooke. I appreciate it. And thanks to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody who did take the time out to uh, go ahead and listen to this webinar, kind of on our part series that we picked up from last year, Get the Most Out of Go Anywhere series. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the cloud, as Brooke mentioned. Um, we will be taking a closer look at some of the benefits of cloud service providers and how Go Anywhere can leverage both the infrastructure as a service as well as some native stores connections via REST and backend API calls and our latest cloud connectors, which Steve will dive into a little bit later in the presentation. Now, some of you may have, been, have had the wonderful privilege to attend a similar cloud-based webinar, so our opening joke might be a bit repetitive, but don't refret. We'll expand on that said joke just a little bit. Now, without further ado, a very important question is to set the stage and get a good visual of the content today. I'm compelled to ask, what, what kind of clothes do clouds wear? And I know you guys are on mute, you can't answer, but I'm sure everybody's screaming out thunderwear. It totally makes sense, it goes without saying. Now, having said that, it kind of gives you a little different perspective when you're outside maybe enjoying, you know, singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. Okay, I'll pull that back in, I digress. I'll get you. <clears throat> well, I'll let you think about that one for a little bit, but I definitely like the fact we're in the right frame of mind now, so let's dive in and get busy, shall we? All right, so what's all the fuss about moving to the cloud? Although it may not be perfect or even the best solution for all businesses, there are a lot of reasons and advantages for doing so. Flexibility. Now, being able to meet the ever-changing demands and business needs without wasting uh, full-time ex expenditures or FT re resources during the proper analysis <clears throat> to decide on what may, may be needed. The cloud provides a means to turn up and down bandwidth or resources in just a few clicks. And with little thought into the configuration of the resources, you can have the applications or infrastructure resources do auto-scaling depending upon thresholds that you define. Now this flexibility of scale not only meets demands, but can avoid costly procurement or potentially even worse, not enough bandwidth to support potential customers and money coming in the door. On the security side of things, we'll touch upon it here and maybe a couple of slides here in just a second as well. This one is an interesting topic as has been lately been a positive reason why businesses are moving to the cloud, but can also be reason for hesitancy. 
I will talk a little bit more about the security of CSPs in a couple of slides, but from a compliance and regulation standpoint, but one of the biggest problems security officers have in the past is sensitive information being lost of a stolen, uh, a lost or stolen laptop. Not only the cost of the hardware itself, but more importantly, the sensitive information that was stored on the device. Incident reporting specifications is very costly, and even if due diligence is proven, if not, fines can break the bank. Disaster recovery. It's always, it's always the good intention of most every business out there. And for those with deep pockets, having geographically dispersed hot data centers with replicated data and resources can be an option, but instead, maybe pushing data up to the cloud can be a very affordable option for all the other guys out there. Most CSPs have different tiers of data storage depending on service level agreements and how fast information would need to be recovered. Not only is it much cheaper than traditional offsite storage, but your data can be replicated as to avoid any of the major geographic disasters. I mean, not to mention, who likes changing out tape media and shipping it to Iron Mountain or some other third party vendor every week and keeping a log of those things and rotating them out every Friday? I don't know about you guys, that wasn't very fun. Document control. Document control is definitely one, one way that we mention very often, but just having your data inherently replicated throughout geographic locations, depending upon how you configure it, can make your data available to all employees no matter where they're located, all with huge performance issues. Cloud storage can keep the, the one version of the truth and maintain versioning on each document. How many of us, especially in the exchange of Lotus Notes admins out there, loathe the idea that email is, is a document management system. In fact, Microsoft, I believe, announced back in 2010 they were going to drop the support for public folders by Exchange 2016. But apparently, everyone went crazy about the idea, and Microsoft has since rescinded that statement since public folders were being used for doc management by so many. Point being is, email has been the de facto way of document exchange and, my, and management, and not a good one, I might add. Cloud document management can facilitate actual efficient collaboration and better true vision into our business critical information. Now this slide here we're talking today is mainly infrastructure as a service. But here we can leverage the cloud service providers and the computing resources. Especially when it comes to installing, go anywhere, leveraging infrastructure as a service and their associated storage options. As you can see, or eh, well, maybe not so clearly on that slide there, um, the top line is for the software as a service, the middle is for infrastructure as a service, and the bottom is for platform as a service. So as you can see, although I, you know, infrastructure as a service is still second in terms of billion spent, the trend for leveraging infrastructure in the, cl the cloud is gaining fastest in popularity, mainly for all the, the reasons previously discussed. So why wouldn't we migrate then? So we just painted what seems to be a picture perfect solution in cloud service providers. So why wouldn't we move our infrastructure up to the cloud? Well, security still seems to be a big reason why most folks are leery of moving all their prized information up to the cloud. Over the past five years or so, we've had some breaches of large cloud-based providers from Adobe, Microsoft Windows, Azure, and even Amazon. But these breaches are not because of inherent security inadequacies, but rather in either configuration issues or social engineering tactics, most notably phishing scams to compromise the system to gain a foothold for further scanning. I know that a lot of folks believe that if you have control of their own devices and equipment, they can better protect them from someone providing a convenience type, type service. Bottom line is, that's the thinking our money under the mattress is, is more secure than, than in the bank, which I suppose is debatable, but seriously, even though even more so now that security is such a hot topic, they remain competitive and all CSPs must put in limited resources into ensuring safety and security of their customers' data. Not only the reputations drive the effort, but also the, the, the so many regulations that are constantly coming out with the new compliance standards in the wake of all high profile breaches of late. This is definitely no shortage of innovation for the cloud service providers to make sure that they have the latest cipher suites, algorithm, key exchange methods to provide customers an ability, the ability to make their data secure. The potential issue may come from unsecured configurations of resources within cloud networks, but it is no different than the risk you run on premise. At least at the CSP level, the infrastructure is provided for compliance regulations and mandates are checked regularly. 
I'm not sure most organizations can honestly say the same thing at their home shops. So in essence, these guys, the folks that are actually housing out the, uh, the cloud types environment, they do have the resources. They do have the, uh, the auditors coming in on a regular basis to check to make sure that their infrastructure is secure. Um, they do have those uh, types of resources to do those things, whereas most organizations trying to do it on their own or on-prem to actually secure a quote-unquote system can make it very, very daunting. This next slide kind of slipped in here. Uh, it's kind of hard to read, um, but just a, a, um, a topic, a speaking topic on kind of thinking like a hacker. And this was just one of the slides that we had for uh, the statistics of any given breach. And I thought it was interesting, the, the ones on the top right and the, and the darker color, those are kind of the cost savings because of what you're doing on the far left. Instant response team, extensive use of encryption, employee training, things like that. The one there at the bottom I thought was interesting uh, to go to this one here is just looking at the extensive cloud migration. Now it was, it was noted in the Panamon Institute as well as the Verizon Data Breach Investigator Report that was mostly done when you were in the midst of doing an actual cloud migration, not when your data was actually out in the cloud. I just thought it was kind of interesting to point out so I, threw it out there just for food for thought, I suppose. All right, so how does going to fit into all this? For now, we're leveraging the security, flexibility, cost effectiveness, disaster recovery, efficiency, and all the benefits of their infrastructure as service models. For instance, we can install Go Anywhere with Amazon Web Services Arena either by spinning up EC2 instances using multiple flavors of Windows or Linux operating systems, or we have the developed with preload instance or AMI using the Windows Server and Linux uh, 2016 versions or multiple versions by searching the AWS Marketplace. And with just a few clicks, we can have go anywhere up and running, testing the point, which we'll kind of go through here in just a second. In the same way, you can run go anywhere within Microsoft Azure by choosing a Windows or Linux resource and installing an MFT in their cloud space. Again, we'll take a look at both, both environments here. Now, with those instances running on cloud resources, Go Anywhere can automate file transfers and data manipulation with ease strictly in the cloud space or between potential hybrid solutions or just trading partners and customers alike. Anything from offloading archived data for cheaper storage use, backups for potential disaster recovery, or for the efficient collaboration and vis visibility for your entire organization, no matter where they're located, without the effects of slow and expansive bandwidth limitations. Now, most of the regulations require data encryption while in transit, as well as at rest. Um, moving files to and from the cloud can be done via HTTPS, as well as server-side encryption levering cloud-managed KMS solutions. Currently, Go Anywhere does have the capability to natively connect up to AWS S3 buckets for that cheap and secure storage since our release of 5.6.0 as well as being added the ability to leverage blob storage within Microsoft Azure. All of these can be server-side AES 256-bit encryption. And that's very, gonna be adhering to the NIST standards for that not only encryption in transit using the HTTPS protocol, but also using those standards so that you're properly encrypting that data at rest. Now, as always, all transactions within Gwony, whether on-prem or in the cloud, instances are audited by service protocol use, file activity and web and admin user activity. These logs can be viewed and segregated out log files via the Go Anywhere GUI, but also have the option to send to a central syslog uh, server should you desire and have the ability to connect up to one. Now here, this one here, <clears throat> not the most colorful in the world. Uh, we kind of went to black and green it looks like. Uh, but this kind of gives you a, a, a real high-level depiction of a common uh, setup. And, I, and, and we're choosing AWS, I guess, for sake of time here. Uh, Azure deployments, if you're familiar with both, it, it, a lot of the terminology and a lot of the actual architecture is going to be the exact same. Um, but this is going through and showing you uh, the top two uh, boxes here. Let me kind of get my little annotator quick here, if I can. I apologize. We're we're new to the to the go to meeting. Uh, just just transitioned over here. So these top two boxes here. Oh, never mind. 
All right, maybe we won't annotate on this one. But the top two boxes at the top, starting from top to bottom, those are gonna be your gateways. Uh, so those are gonna be set up kind of in your public DMZ area. Uh, the bottom two boxes below those are gonna be your MFT environment. Now the entire green square uh, that we're looking at, that's your virtual private, um, private cloud. This is where, think of it as your VPN, where all your infrastructure is gonna be held within there. So everything within here is going to look very, very similar to what you have on-prem. You're going to have things within your uh, enclosed environment. Your gateways are going to be sitting in your DMZ. One thing that we're not seeing here, and I apologize. Oh, here's my little, my little pen here. We're going to have, illustrated with this little guy here, we're going to have logical security groups, or what we call network security groups within Amazon so that we can keep traffic only that's responsible or anything that we need to come into the DMZs and keep it separate from our back-end private network here. This is going to be very, very similar to you doing an actual physical DMZ layer here and having Gateway do what it does best, you know, allows and brokers those connections within the private um, internal network without having to open up those internal ports as well as not having to stage files within, within the actual um, network. Uh, so some of the other things here, again, uh, you'll also notice uh, we do have availability zones. Uh, we have A as well as B. Um, just again, those that are familiar with AWS, uh, what we're looking at here is we do have an active active cluster. Uh, a couple key things uh, within AWS, you'll notice uh, just like on-prem, you have a responsibility to externalize your database. Uh, so that's what we're using. We're gonna use the Amazon uh, RDS service. In this case, it's gonna be the MariaDB. That's externalized. The EFS uh, file solution, these boxes are actually Linux boxes. So now we have our common network share, our common database, and now that we can go ahead and do an actual um, uh, cluster in this instance here uh, to increase that performance uh, within here. So this here, the reason why from the availability zones, uh, if, if maybe you're thinking, uh, you know, that seems kind of interesting for an active active, because a true active active means if one goes down, one instance happens to go down, both of these gateways are going to know about both of these instances, so it's going to redirect traffic to the other one. Now, availability zones are technically geographic different locations, uh, but within AWS and Azure and things like that, the availability zones that they do, the latency is so low that they are able to do configurations like this. It's when you get to uh, different regions in, in AWS talk, and I'm, I apologize for drawing a blank on the Azure side, uh, kind of how that works. All right, one last thing. Let me see if I can erase these. Erase these little tools here. Do, 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 do. Uh, somewhere on here. Well, trying to erase these little, little buggers here. Um, but in any case, uh, we can go through and I'm going to show you just real quick as far as the interface within AWS. Uh, there we go, erase all drawings, I'll get there eventually. Uh, so here we can kind of go through and take a look at within, this is gonna be the AWS console. Uh, so one of the things that we talked about, it, it really is the same as if you're standing up your virtual environment or if there are physical machines on your, your environment. But what's nice too about the, the AWS as well as Azure is if you do navigate to the AWS marketplace, uh, we do have uh, Windows and Linux AMIs that are actually pre-built out there for you. So you can just go to the AWS Marketplace, click on that link there, and within here, now we can do a search and just type in Go Anywhere. Oops, if I can spell. And those pop-ups will, um, oh, AWS Marketplace, let's get in the right area first. And those will actually pop up. So we see we've got an MFT instance for Linux, as well as for Windows. And this will get you those base installs. And then from there, it's just very, very similar to what you see when you go through. You select your security group, the VPCs, all those types of things. Don't need to go through those things. Similar for Microsoft Azure. 
um, or Azure, I should say. Um, at the very first kind of home screen here, we also have a marketplace down there as well. And if you want to search for, again, go anywhere, uh, where that'll pull up the different versions. Uh, you can always select, uh, it doesn't look like it tells you the version here, uh, but if you want to deselect and make sure you're getting the Linux version, you can kind of do that and it'll, it'll let you know which version you're getting, Linux or Windows. Again, just a quick way that we have those pre-built versions of Go Anywhere so that you can get up and running, launched in a secure uh, cloud environment, whether you're using AWS or Azure in this, in this instance. Um, with that, I'm going to kind of pass the, the reins over to Steve, and he's going to kind of dive a little bit more into what we've been developing and what the dev team has been developing on cloud connectors. Uh, so with further ado, uh, Steve, give me a second. I'll pass you right. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Great job. And I think, yeah. I, did, I, think I did, hopefully. Yep, I believe so. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, let me go ahead and save from current slide. There we go. All right, thanks again, Dan. Um, I'm going to be talking about clock connectors. I do have a few slides to go through, and then uh, the bulk of the, the remaining time, I guess, will be spent doing a live demo showing you clock connectors in action. So let me page down here. Now, clock connectors are a relatively new feature. It's something we added in the 5.7 release, which was towards the summer, this last summer. And it offers out-of-the-box integration with popular applications like Salesforce, SharePoint, Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, you know, so forth. Uh, most of these cloud-based services do provide some type of RESTful or SOAP-based API. And then our cloud connectors in Go Anywhere uh, reach out to them via web services uh, to, you know, interact with those services. So with Salesforce, it might be working with accounts. With uh, Dropbox, you're going to be working with files to upload and download and stuff. Uh, now we have, I think, about 22 on the marketplace today. Um, one of the nice things about Cloud Connector technology is that um, you don't have to restart Go Anywhere to use a new Cloud Connector. So once we release Cloud Connectors, the functionality, then each individual Cloud Connector is an individual component that we publish to a marketplace, and you can download it as uh, needed. So we have 22 currently on the marketplace. I'll show you some of those in a little bit. And we also have, let's see, about eight or so in the works. We are working on Azure Data Lake Storage, uh, several other Amazon AWS ones like CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and ECS. And we're working on some bigger ones like SAP HANA and Dynamics ERP. Uh, you can build your own cloud connectors with a drag and drop designer. If you uh, are going to a customer, you're familiar probably with the project designer. I'll show you how you can create your own uh, cloud connector, which is pretty cool. And you could submit it to us to publish on our marketplace. Next slide. So how are customers using cloud connectors today? Well, the bulk of them are probably using it for file transfers. That's what we're seeing so far. Uh, we do have some working with it for CRM and other applications, but the bulk is moving files. Obviously, the most uh, use case of Go Anywhere is to move data. We specialize in that virtually to any file system. Um, however, with services, it was always kind of difficult you know, to interact with Dropbox or Box. And you could do it yourself. Uh, you could build a bunch of RESTful web service tasks and, if you uh, are a developer, you can figure out the JSON and uh, how to authenticate and everything else, or you could just use the ones that we have out of the box. Uh, we build these cloud connectors and publish them uh, for just a small fee. So the bulk of our customers are using them to move files. Uh, we also use it for secure forms. So with secure forms, you can build a user interface that prompts the user for certain data, and then that calls a project, and then that project can interact with the service. I'll show an example here later where you can submit support ticket information, calls a project, and then that project will submit a ticket to JIRA. So kind of cool. Uh, we also have a Vitero uh, cloud connector, which does disarming of files, basically removing malicious content. So I'll show you how we can uh, scan files to remove content from uh, files and then create a kind of a scrubbed version. And then you can also create your own. This picture here just kind of illustrates um, where cloud connectors fit into this. So projects are really the workflow definition and go anywhere. It defines all of your source data, where you want it to move them to, uh, encryption, decryption, all that stuff. And so projects kind of glue uh, both the source and destination together. So down at the bottom, number three, 
you can use IBMI programs, you can kick it off via intranet sites or PHP or uh, command line actions or web services, ultimately calling a project. And then those projects can work with Box, Salesforce, Dropbox, and all the other uh, cloud connectors that we have. Okay, and then here's a uh, just a screenshot of the marketplace, which takes me into the live demo, the fun portion. Let's switch over to Chrome, and I got to get this uh, dialog out of the way. Uh, just a sec here. There we go. Okay. So what you're seeing here is the dashboard to go in our MFT. And I think my zoom's appropriate. Let me just make sure. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you can see it better. Under the system menu, we have a cloud connectors menu action that's available for product administrators. Product administrator is going to be kind of like the, the God level access to, to work with the, the global settings and these cloud connectors. Here you can see all the different cloud connectors that we have already installed. Um, there's the difference between custom cloud connectors that you create or marketplace ones that we host for you. So you can see on the marketplace ones, there are different versions as we update them. Um, if there was one out of date, let me scroll down here a little bit, there's a WebDocs Cloud Connector, and we can see that there's a new version of it. So you just click on Update. It connects out to our marketplace, downloads the configuration file, updates it, and you don't have to restart going to our MFT. So pretty cool technology. If I scroll back up, go to Add Cloud Connector. This is going to show our marketplace, and we're constantly adding new ones over time. Uh, we got, like I said, like seven or eight currently in the works, so you'll see a few more published this week even. Um, at the top here, you can search for a cloud connector based on the name, or I'll kind of just spin through here and illustrate some of them uh, so you can see what they do. So we have quite a few with Amazon AWS. So with like the EC2 connector, you can create instances, you can start and stop them, uh, and work with your EC2 servers out on Amazon. You can also work with the, the serverless code functions, uh, Lambda is what they call it. Uh, SNS and SNQ for kind of publishing messages and working with the queue. Uh, some of the popular ones here are Box. Uh, we got quite a few working with that. So let's say you wanted to uh, connect up to a Box user's account, download a series of files and kind of zip them up and kind of archive them for um, just historical purposes, kind of make backups and stuff you could. And you can see that each one has an individual price here. So this one's like $4.95. And if you uh, don't have it installed yet, you can easily click a button that just says free trial which downloads it and puts it on your system. All right, we have Google Translate. Uh, this one's kind of neat. If you had a website full of like HTML files, we can actually take your HTML files and go anywhere, pump them up to Google Translate and get them into different languages, which is neat. Uh, we have Jira. So if you have a Jira instance, whether that's a cloud or on-prem, you can work with it to create cases. I'll show an example of that here in a little bit. Uh, we have ShareFile, Trello. As you can see, there's just kind of kind of gets repetitive because there's so many of them. But we have Viva CRM, we have Dropbox. Uh, let's see, Goner Command Connector. If you use Goner Command, this is neat because it it can uh, add users, remove users, kick off projects, do all sorts of stuff from GACMD like command line. Um, but now you can kick those off from a project, which may be a little bit more uh, intuitive. Other ones that we have, we have Google Cloud Storage, Google Drive. Uh, just quite a few Jenkins dynamics. Let's go ahead and show them off. So once the cloud connector is installed, I'm going to show, uh, let's say, Salesforce first. If I click on the cloud connector, you're going to see a list of actions. So with the CRM one, you're going to mainly be working with accounts, contacts, uh, contracts, you know, cases, what, whatnot. And so based on this cloud connector, I can go over to resources. And resources are a great way to define the connection information to your servers. So if it's gonna be like an FTP server, SFTP, um, or a cloud connector, most of them need some type of credentials to authenticate. So you go to a resource and you can say add cloud connector and you can see this drop down here. These are the cloud connectors that we have installed. If I scroll down in the list, there should be Salesforce. Salesforce connector, there we go, continue takes us to the ad page where we can type in a name. So this would be our Salesforce Cloud Connector. It does require a URL, client ID, secret, and some other information. Um, you can get that information from your Salesforce instance. So each one is going to prompt you for unique information. I'm going to go back to here, search for my Salesforce instance, because we already defined this uh, prior. So we have this dev account that we have set up, the client ID that we want to authenticate with, uh, the client secret. 
as well as the username, password, and security token. So it, Salesforce does require a little bit more information. Some of them are pretty simple, like just basic user password. Some of them are a little bit more complex. You can click on the test button. Basically just test the resources to make sure that credentials are good and that you have access to that server. So I'm gonna say done, and then from there, once you have your resources defined, so we'll just start off with Salesforce, but I'm gonna show you Vitero, Dropbox, and a few others too. But then you'll go into projects. Now projects are the workflow definition where you define your source, your destination, what do you wanna do with the files, um, any parsing, encrypting, and so forth. So let's look at our Salesforce project that I set up. Okay, and I'm gonna go into here. This is gonna create an account and contact. So this is what we refer to as the project designer. Um, there's multiple different kind of panes. On the left side, we have the component library. These are all the different actions that we can perform inside of a project. So if you wanted to search for like, let's say SFTP, uh, those are all the different actions for uh, SFTP or just plain FTP, you could as well. Or you can expand some of these different folders. So if you want to do a file transfer or maybe do a text message or translate some data and so forth, you just expand these different categories. But at the top, there's a new category for cloud connectors. Under here is all, a listing of all the different ones that you have installed or your custom ones. And for each one, you can expand it. So let's say Salesforce, expand it. And from here, you can authenticate, you can add or update accounts, you can work with cases, contracts. Um, the actions are pretty easy to kind of explain. But if you wanted to delete an account or something, you simply just drag it, put it over into the main module, or you can double click. So delete campaign, double click, adds it right to your project. Okay, so let's go ahead and delete these two. Now this project, it's pretty simple. I'm gonna first authenticate. So keep in mind that uh, all of the actions are defined inside the cloud connector. So the cloud connector exposed actions to authenticate and then work with the account and contact. So I'm gonna say, let's authenticate first to this Salesforce account. We're gonna keep track of our authentication token. Most of these use OAuth tokens or some type of secret um, token values. So we're gonna keep track of that and what we refer to as our auth token. And we're gonna pass that in in future actions. So we're gonna say, go ahead and use this auth token to this Salesforce instance. We want to add an account. And then on the account name, this is where you can specify any data. Now, a lot of this data probably wouldn't be hard coded. It would be maybe something like uh, database value. So you'd have some type of value that maybe you're extracting from a JSON file or a database or whatever you need to to work with it. But for now, I'm just gonna simply hard code it. So you have like an account name and as you can see here, just a slew of different settings you can set on an account in Salesforce. But at the bottom here, we're gonna keep track of the account ID. So once we add an account to Salesforce, go ahead and refer to the account ID in the future. So like here, if I wanna create a new contact for that account, so I'm gonna say, go ahead and add this user to this account and then let's go ahead and execute this. Okay, takes just a second because my other tab up here, I have Salesforce currently authenticated. I don't see my Cloud Connector LLC test account. So once this runs, which it did run successfully, if I view the job log, it's gonna basically just illustrate that the Salesforce connector was able to authenticate, update account and create the, the contact accordingly. If I refresh, there's my new account. If I scroll down a little bit uh, to the contact section, I'm gonna see my new contact added to that account. So that's a really simple example of showing how you can take something kind of complex, but because uh, behind the scenes between going to MFT and uh, Salesforce, there's a ton of JSON authentication and other values going back and forth. Um, but to the end user, it's super simple to add accounts or uh, work with files. The next one here is gonna be Vitero. So let's take a look at Vitero. I'm gonna exit out of this project and I've got quite a few projects here. So I'm going to just search or filter. Okay, and if I click on edit there, it takes me into Vitero. So this one down, let's see, expand this section. We can check file status, download the file, get sanitation report, or mainly just sanitize and download file. So with Vitero, it's a service that allows you to scrub malicious contents from files. So if you wanted to send like PDFs or um, I don't know, Word documents or whatever, it would scrub the malicious potential viruses out of them and then uh, give you a clean version back. So I'm going to, let's go to this PDF folder here. Um, we have one with some sample um, malicious content. So if I go into this PDF, 
you're going to see here that it can't open this calc.exe because there's actually JavaScript embedded inside of it that's trying to launch an application, which would be, you know, bad. Uh, fortunately, Adobe Reader prevented it. However, you probably want to scrub that data. So with this connector, we're going to scan and download the file. We're going to connect up to Vitero. We're going to say, take this PDF that has the bad content, scrub it, and then download the clean version to here. Um, on the sprint, we're just going to print out a report because Vitero actually gives us back a status report indicating uh, the details of the scan. If I execute it, now, for simplicity, I just dropped the file into this folder right afterwards, um, right before this demo. But then I can see here that once I launched it, it didn't actually have the exe file. So, all right, that's just showing another example. Now, the bulk of our customers are doing it, uh, cloud connectors for uploading download files. So let's show Dropbox. All right, so Dropbox. We can create a workspace. This is just our typical workspace task. As you can see, cloud connectors do have a special cloud-like little icon here next to them. So we have a traditional task as well as a cloud connector. Cloud connector here is going to make directory. So we're gonna connect up to our Dropbox instance. We're gonna create a new folder. So I'm gonna switch over to Firefox, go to Dropbox. And as you can see, there's no uh, new folder specified inside of here. Back over to Chrome, and I'm gonna say, let's create this new folder and then let's upload a file to it. So I'm gonna take this audit log uh, report and I'm gonna place it into that new folder cr just created. And then I'm going to connect that same Dropbox resource, pass in uh, the file that I wanna download and just download to the, the destination directory. This is just for quick illustration. Typically this file would be placed on some other network or maybe sent off to an SFTP server or backed up or so forth. If I click on execute, it creates the directory should upload it and download it, assuming everything worked. Go back over to Firefox, and you can see the new folder was just created. Click on this new folder, and this report was uploaded. So, kind of cool. Uh, another one very similar um, that's also pretty popular is our SharePoint. So let's, let's take a look at SharePoint. And edit. Oops. Um, in SharePoint, it's a, it's a file system connector. So most of our file system can connectors, um, they can upload, download, list directories, rename, delete, and do your typical file actions. Most of those are gonna be your 49 or 495 price tag. We also have the premium ones, which are gonna be 29.95, and those are for like CRM or ERP or the, the more elaborate type connectors. But once you start working with a couple of file system ones, you'll see that they're kind of repetitive because this SharePoint one is also going to work with directories. So here we can authenticate to SharePoint. And then we're going to persist the session ID and the request digest. So SharePoint, actually their web service API is rather complex. And so we have to keep track of two different variable types. We're gonna pass that into each request after this to authenticate with that same session. So we're gonna say persist the session to the SharePoint server. And uh, we're gonna create a new folder and we're gonna upload a file, the same file basically, to this folder in SharePoint. So if I execute this, switch over to SharePoint. This is my SharePoint folder. I'm going to refresh. So let's go back to documents. There we go. And they got this little uh, icon next to the new folder so you can see that it was recently created. Click here and then a few seconds ago this file was uploaded. So pretty simple but you're kind of getting the point. Now for cloud connectors, uh, let me illustrate how you can create your own if you wanted to. So over here on the Cloud Connector Management page, I can say Add Cloud Connector, and let's create a new connector versus downloading one from the marketplace. Let's say uh, Weather Service. And the Weather Service requires maybe a user and password to authenticate, so we're gonna say Text Field. Oops, Text Field. And also a password. This is gonna be Password. Uh, required password is going to be the value that we're going to pass into the project. And then we need a, a user. So let's give it a user uh, variable name. And required, let's say yes. Oops. Yes. Password, yes. And this isn't going to actually work, but I'm just kind of illustrating it here. So this cloud, this custom cloud connector has a user and password that we're going to prompt in the resource. And then we can have different actions. So let's say get weather. Uh, and then this action is going to get called anytime the user drags and drops that into the project designer. 
And from here, then it becomes a series of REST tasks. You might say REST post, um, and you need to post information to that service. For now, I'm just going to delete this because it's not going to actually work functionally. And I'm going to prompt them for one more variable. I'm going to say text field, get weather. And on this text field, oops, it's going to be the zip, zip code. Zip code. All right. So you're kind of getting the idea of how you would build out these uh, definitions. Uh, the resource test is what happens when you actually define it as a resource and click the test button. So if I go over to resources and if I added that weather service, so if you were to build your own connector to maybe a different popular application, you would have uh, that uh, inside of your clock connector definition and then you can build a resource for it and it's going to prompt you for whatever is defined. So here I prompted them for a user and a password. And, oops, sorry, I think I saved that. And click test. It would actually execute the resource test. I can save and close that resource. And then under projects, if I created a new one for the weather service, under cloud connectors, there should be one here. Yep, there it is, weather service, get weather. So whatever action is defined becomes available to the designer. And get weather is gonna prompt me for the resource which has your credentials to connect up to the system, as well as the zip code, which we can pass in, you know, some type of to zip code to check the weather. So that's just kind of illustrating how a cloud connector is built. And if you build your own cloud connector, please submit them to uh, sales and support. We'll work with you on that and uh, possibly be able to get you published in our marketplace. It was designed so that each one can be published and you might even be able to get some kickbacks, uh, which would be pretty nice. All right, so that's a custom one. The last example that I'm gonna show you here is a little bit more elaborate. It's kind of like an actual use case of submitting a support ticket. So I'm gonna go under the services menu and show off secure forms. So under secure forms, I have this custom form. And if you haven't built these before, um, they interface with projects. They kind of give it a GUI front end where you can build like custom fields that get passed into a project that the project can then use to, uh, you know, submit tickets or whatever it needs to. So here's the form name and on the project tab, this is the project we're gonna call when the secure form is submitted. So we got this JIRA project, which is gonna submit a ticket to JIRA. We have the user to um, authenticate as. Now on the access tab, this is how you want to access the, the uh, form and you can have it publicly available. You can remove public access and make it only authenticated for certain users. So if I gave out this URL here, I'm gonna copy this link and went over to let's say Firefox and a new tab and clicked on that. There we go. So it's showing my custom form that I built. Back on the admin side, let me explain some of these fields. I'm also going to give them access to this specific user. And on components, this is where you can customize the screen. So submit support uh, JIRA ticket. Let's change the title of it. You can customize the instructions with uh, whatever you wanted to here. And then as far as fields are concerned, on the left side, uh, you can add different components. So if you want to add another text field to the screen, let's go ahead and uh, select that there. And we can say my custom, oops, custom field. And then the label is label whatever, uh, and you can see here that it kind of shows you what that form will look like and stuff. But ultimately this designer, once you save it and publish it out there, um, it's going to give a form that end users can fill out. So I'm gonna go back over here. Now each one of these fields is gonna pass a variable to a project. So let's look at subject here. So I'm gonna say, take the subject. Uh, this variable is called description. Uh, this variable is called name. We have attachments, which are actually uploading files to uh, the form and then those files get passed into the project because when somebody submits a support ticket, I want to optionally allow them to attach files that maybe are screenshots or log files or whatever they need to. So here is the attachments, drag and drop kind of file area. I'm gonna cancel all this and show you the project. All right, over the projects and then let's see, Jira is the one I defined for this. So our Jira Cloud Connector gives you actions for, let me expand that. You can add attachments, you can add comments, you can add votes, watchers. If you're familiar with uh, Jira, you're probably gonna see these actions and kind of get excited because there's a lot of, you know, we work with comments and deleting issues and moving issues and transitioning and so forth. But I'm gonna do a simple action just to create a new one. 
So I'm going to say connect up to our sample Jira instance. Uh, we have a sample project with the project key of Sam. Our subject is going to be passed into us from the user. Our description is going to be passed in from the user. We're also going to append this to say it was reported by whoever that, that user was. And then we have the issue type key, which is a story. This can be customized based on your Jira instance. All right, now at the bottom here, we have issue key, which is going to be our unique Jira ticket. Now, if the secure form has files, we want to go ahead and add attachment. So we're going to do the add attachment action to the Jira Cloud Connector. We're going to pass in the Jira key or issue key for Jira that we want to associate the file to. So then we're going to, the attachment field, we're going to say pass in the file, which may be a screenshot or a log or whatever it may be, and attach it to that Jira case. We're going to take it a step further. If the user provides a phone number, we're also going to subscribe them to a notification list. We're going to use our Amazon SNS, which is Simple Notification Service, to publish a message to their phone. And the, the subject's going to be support case. And we're going to give them the issue key that we created. And we'll just notify them that basically we'll keep, keep them updated. On secure forms, you can build a custom response. So we're going to say your support ticket was submitted successfully. Uh, please refer to your issue key uh, in future communication. OK, so this is just the project definition. We got the secure form. Let's go back to the web client. And I'm going to go ahead and log in here. Oops. OK, and what you're seeing here, this is uh, the 6.0 beta version of Gornier FT. So the web client might look a little bit different uh, if you haven't seen this before. But on the left side here, we got forms, our available forms. And then this is going to be that form that I created to submit the support ticket. Click on that. It takes me into here, which my subject is going to be this uh, webinar is awesome. The description is going to be uh, whatever issue we are facing. And then your name, let's go ahead and submit my name. Phone number, we'll leave that blank for now. But you could submit a phone number if you wanted to get a text message. And then once you attach a file, you can drag and drop uh, just from your desktop. Or you can use our uh, the uploader there. Once I submit this, it's going to call project. That project is going to create a Jira ticket with the attachment and information. Well, it should, so we'll see. <laughs> Live demos are always fun. OK, there we go. Uh, it ran successfully because I got the response of uh, the Jira ticket number. So it actually connected to Jira, created the ticket, returned back the issue ID, and then told the end user, here's your ticket for future reference. If I go over to our Jira instance, and let's say refresh. There we go. This webinar is awesome. Click on that case. I can see whatever issue we're facing. We have uh, my name that was appended to uh, the description as well as the attachment uploaded to Jira with that same case number. So kind of cool. Just kind of illustrates the full cycle of what you can do. Let's see. I think that kind of was the last example I was going to show off. I don't know what kind of questions we have out there, but maybe I can address some of those before we switch gears. Uh, Brooke, do you have any questions that I should address to the group? Yeah, a lot have been answered already. Um, one that came in, one clarification, uh, the AWS AMIs, do those include both the gateway and MFT? Uh, they, the AMIs published on the marketplace, I think those are only for Goner MFT. Um, so with the AWS and Azure marketplaces, we publish Goner MFT AMIs and stuff, but not Goner Gateway. Got it. All right. And then we got a couple questions just around what cloud connectors are coming out. Can you give us any sneak peek at ones that are in development now? Uh, sure. Let me switch over because I got a list somewhere. Yeah, because I made a list here. Um, Azure Data Lake Storage, that is very close. Uh, we're also working on Amazon AWS CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and ECS. So CloudTrail is for logging, and CloudWatch is kind of like your budgeting. And then ECS is for your uh, container service, so like Docker containers and stuff. Uh, we're also working on SAP HANA, as well as Dynamics 365 ERP. So we got about seven that are in the works uh, to be published within the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's in addition to the 22 that we offer today. Awesome. Um, one more question that just came in. Can Go Anywhere MFT be hosted on Google Cloud? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, there's no problem with that. I know a couple of customers have talked about it. I've never actually worked with them directly, but yeah, it should be fine. So Gwen MFT really just runs on any Windows or Linux platform. And most cloud providers, whether it's Google, Azure, or Amazon, um, support your typical uh, Windows and Linux environments. Uh, Amazon has their own Amazon special flavor of Linux, which kind of optimizes some of the network configurations on it. We support that as well. It's pretty much a standard Linux system as far as Gwen is concerned. Great. Uh, you mentioned the cost for cloud connectors. Someone just wanted to confirm, is that a one-time payment? Yeah, there is a, a maintenance. It's perpetual. Um, I think uh, Brian can kind of chime in on that one. But yeah, it is just a one-time payment. Uh, let me pull up the marketplace here. So $4.95 would be a, just a one-time fee for some of those. And you can see the pricing I'm listing here. Most of them are $4.95. Um, the only other ones would be Jira, because that has a ton of actions, a ton of things you can do with it, and our Salesforce. Um, and our CRM type connectors. Awesome. Steve, if you want to go back to the PowerPoint, I can go through the last two slides and we can let people um, weigh in with any other questions they have. Okay. And we can answer a few more. All right. So before we do drop off, if anyone has had their questions answered and isn't able to stick around, just want to make sure everyone knows we do have other webinars in this series available on our website, and you can just type in that URL at the bottom of the screen to access those. So lots of good topics, lots of good demos just like this one, and uh, make sure you check it out. And then next slide, just in terms of next steps, if you liked what you saw today, uh, we do have a, a more full a custom demo available on our website, and you can just go to goanywhere.com slash demo if you're interested in seeing more of our cloud functionality or talking through cloud connectors at more length, uh, you can just make a note on that form when you submit it. And um, that next slide too also has our contact information too. If you have any questions that uh, didn't get covered today or you wanna talk to a sales rep in more detail, you certainly can. Great, so if you're not able to stick around for more questions, um, thanks for joining and we hope you have a really good day. And for those of you who are still with us, let me peek in at the questions we are getting. Steve, I know you're popping in here and answering a few. Are there any you want to answer verbally that maybe you already answered for one person but might be good for the group? Sure. One just came through not too long ago about Salesforce Connector working with custom objects. I thought that was kind of an interesting one because we recently published a new version of the Salesforce Connector that supports custom objects. So most objects are like accounts, contacts, cases, and so forth, but we do support custom objects as well in Salesforce. Awesome. Let's see here. Uh, we have one about uh, migrating licenses between environments. Uh, yes, we do support that. So if they wanted to move an on-prem copy over to uh, uh, a cloud-based environment, they can. Uh, we have a question about file size limits, which is uh, we don't really have any limits built in. Um, the only limits would be imposed by the service. So some of the services may have a, a limit, like maybe I think Amazon S3 buckets have like a five gig limit per file. Um, so the limits that we would have are based on the service that we're connecting to, not built in to go anywhere. Uh, let's see, what else do we have that are good for the group? Oh, uh, we have one asking about Vitero definitions being updated, how often uh, that happens for data sanit uh, sanitizing. Um, that is their service that they take care of. We can definitely put you in touch with the Vitero people um, that are kind of like our liaisons to work on those type of questions. Uh, we just interface with them. So I'm not exactly sure how often their definitions are updated. And that looks like a, a lot of the general ones. Steve, do you want to go to the next slide just so people can see that uh, contact information from us? Yeah, for sure. Perfect. All right. Well, it looks like most of the questions uh, have come in and we've we've gotten to them. But like we said in that demo, or, or sorry, the um, webinar questionnaire that's going to pop up, feel free to add any more questions that you had for us. Um, reach out at the contact info on the screen. If, if you want to get in touch and thank you guys for joining. Thank you, Steve and Dan for presenting. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.